Hello, my name is Naranjan, the host of Master of Your Crafts podcast. Learning from leaders who are continuously inspired, passionate, and driven to align with their soul purpose, sharing their gifts to bring healing to others. The music is composed by Rebecca Everett. Today is episode number 42, and I'll be talking to Peter Regino, an artist, a musician, and a treasure hunter. His artistic and musical style is an original expression that comes from deep within his soul. After spending over 5,000 hours studying the human figure alone, he's created over 35 sketchbooks, thousands of drawings, hundreds of paintings, and numerous third dimensional works. Peter is inspired by nature, seeing the beauty in all places from a tree bark, a weathered building, subway tunnels, and much more. He has developed a new passion for music and is dedicated with full force to elevate its sacred qualities and bring harmony to all forms of creative expression. He's inspired by medicine work, the potent incantation of Hikaris and in Karis and sitting with master teachers such as ayahuasca. Peter is dedicated to art and music as an act of love, time, patience, and devotion. Hello and welcome to Peter. How are you, Peter? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited to have this enriching conversation with you to learn more about an email that I received from you that said in your signature, I am human. And that intrigued me to learn more about you and what put you in that space of really stepping into the humanness of who we are, amalgamating the soul journey and all that, I wanna say deliciousness that is offered to us in life but is often difficult because life experiences kind of take over i think they can uh, for sure i think for for most people life does take over because there's a structure out there that that we can plug into that is planned sort of you know a, a path that's already created that we can all sync with and say okay this is this is a path that works we know that we can do this and that we can you know make a living um put food on our table a roof over our heads so the you know the spiritual path is it's something that obviously we're all on regardless it's just a matter of how much attention we're paying to it i have this, these circumstances where i've been able to completely pay attention to it just because that's what i chose i kind of didn't take on specific responsibilities in my life, like a family or children or anything like that, because I was dedicated to this path, a path that was kind of put forth to me when I was a very young, I was like eight years old. I was on a train with my father in the city. We were looking at all these murals that were painted in the subway stations. So when the train left the subway station, the murals that were on the wall looked like a flip book. So they, they literally moved like an animation. And it was, it was just this day. It was the first day I'd had my father work for the New York City Transit Authority. He was a track walker. So he had taken me into work with him for the first day. So we were in and out of all the subway stations and he had the key to all the gates. You know, it was like a big thing for me. And that was just the culmination of the day. And um, when he showed me those, those things, I was just in awe. And I remember him looking down at me and saying, you know, these, these people that come down here and, and paint these things on the walls, they, they don't get paid to do that. That's just something that's within them that they that they feel like they need to do. And when he said that to me, it was like a lightning bolt just struck me. It was like the first time I was aware that I had a soul or an intuition because mm -hmm. I knew right at that moment when he said that, that I was an artist. And I was like, just like these people that he was talking about. So I knew I was an artist when I was eight years old. So I followed that intuition and I followed that path and gave up anything else that was in the way of that. So I was able to, to walk that and to experience that 
um, the clarity of that path up till now. And I'm still walking that path. Wow. What a profound moment. And such a treasured moment for you to have with your father at that age of him literally unlocking your creativity and your future to a certain degree. How beautiful is that? What a gift. Yeah, it was amazing. It, it sometimes feels like a dream, like I didn't really happen, but I mean, I know it happened. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's, uh, it's one of those things. Yeah. So fast forward, what do you believe about yourself now? Tapping into the world of creativity in all forms, all aspects of the creative outlet and really delving into that space and relishing all it has to offer. What do you believe about yourself being in that space? And do you feel it defines who you are to a certain degree? It's hard for me to speak of just myself because my real feeling is that it's just who we are as human beings. I recently went down to the jungle. Um, well, not recently, but a couple of years ago, I was down in the jungles of Peru um, in the Amazon with the Shipibo tribe working with them and their indigenous practices. And they pretty much have, they've built themselves a place to, to live, a shelter. They have food around them, whether it be, you know, fruits and, you know, sometimes there's fish and this, whatever they, whatever they get to eat. They don't have anything else to do than just be there and live. I mean, it's not an easy life because they, they have to deal with the floods and there's so many different things that nature brings to them that they have to, you know, work around um, mosquitoes. <laughs> but um, there's nothing for them to do except eat every day and fix up their houses, fix their land, basically, to make sure that nothing's leaking, whatever it is, someone's got a problem here, they fix it. So what do they do all day? They pretty much play this idea of being creative to modern society seems to be a foreign thing now, but it's not a foreign thing. It's, it's who we are. We are creative. All of us are creative. No child needs instruction on how to bang a drum or how to sing out a song. No child needs to be told how to push a, push a crayon on a piece of paper. It's, there's no instruction needed, but I just happened to continue to do that. As time went on, I stayed within that realm of what's natural to us in the first place. So I think that's what human beings are, you know, are hardwired to do. So, so yeah, it defines me as a human being because I feel like I'm tapping into the natural um, tendencies that human beings generally would, would gravitate towards, which is play. Creativity yeah. is play. Yeah. So a, I think this says a lot about us as human beings. <laughs> you know, that we're really not, we're really not meant to be workers in a factory or, you know what I mean? That's not really yeah. our, our real desire is to be free of that, to be on vacation, to be exploring, to be discovering, to be at the beach, to be finding shells, whatever it is. That's where we, we all try to get to. We try to get back to that. Some people are more successful than others. You know, for me, for me, I, like I said, I've given up a lot of different types of responsibilities in order to continue to follow this muse. But um, I think it's just natural for, for us as, as human beings to be this way. Yeah. It's almost like a vicious cycle to a certain degree. We get lured by all the wonderful things that is presented to us through life. This cycle of life, be it the evolution and the cycle of our soul. What does that look like? And do you feel in this lifetime it is our calling or it's just our innate being of who we are to be creative beings? I'm not, I think it's innate. I think it's completely innate. Well, the only reason I think that is because, I mean, I, it's easy for me to say that from my position because all I do is create every day. But if, I, if you look at any child, their natural tendency is to create. You don't have to teach a child, you know, adults have to be taught how to be, to, to, to remember that, but children don't have to be taught to do that. They're just naturally at play. So, so I think it's completely innate. And I think a lot of people would want, could benefit from having a little bit of that back in their life for sure. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. How did you get into the space of doing such beautiful, intricate, emotional imagery in your book? I know the book that you have, the I Am Human piece. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get to that space? Because the very profound images and the very moving, what took you on that journey? Oddly enough, I came from a space of, of deep fear when I was a child. I was very afraid of everything, extremely like, I don't know, I'm just afraid of everybody, everything. And um, as I, I guess I basically tried a lot of different things to try to cover up that fear, to make myself brave, to make myself so I wasn't, so I didn't appear that way, like weak. Um, the culmination of that was when I joined the Marine Corps which was the ultimate cover up and I was good at it. I mean, I was great at it. Really great. I was, I was a great Marine. I was pretty much like an, like, like the model Marine. But when I left the Marine Corps, that all basically started to unravel because I, I, I left the Marine Corps to continue to pursue my career as an artist, my dream as an artist. And, um, there were so many layers that I had to un undo. And I, I wound up getting deeply into drugs and, and, and wound up being arrested and put into a one-year program for possession of drugs. And, uh, you know, I had to go through AA and really face myself and figure out these things that were, you know, these masks that I was wearing, these, these protections that I had that were covering up who I was, who my, my true soul was. Mm -hmm. And that's what started the journey the journey when i when i completed that one year program i knew i had to move back to new york because in my brain the i knew i wanted to be an artist but i knew that in my mind an artist is someone that can draw anything they want anytime they want that's my own personal definition it's not that's not a definition that anybody else needs to adhere to but i wanted to be a professional artist to make my living doing it so the one thing that stuck out in my mind the most was that I needed to personally learn how to draw the human figure because I felt like if I didn't learn how to draw the human figure well, I felt like that was the, you know, the, 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 the cream of the crop when it came to being an artist. Yeah. If you knew how to draw the, draw the human figure, then you, you, you had figured out how to be an artist, a professional artist. So, so my goal was to learn how to draw the human figure. So I, I moved back to New York from California, where I was living at the time, mm. and I decided to study figure drawing. I wanted, to, I wanted to study figure drawing at the uh, Art Students League in New York, but um, a friend introduced me to a local class that was happening, a group called the, the, the Drawing Studio on Long Island, run by Jeffrey Fisher. And uh, from the first second I got there, I pretty much found a home in that, in that space. It was like I found my people. They were going for it big time. The rest of them were like kids. They were just out of high school. So they were drawing circles around me because I, I never drew from the human figure until I was like 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So the book I Am Human is my journey from day one, the first sketchbook. I never even kept the sketchbook. You know, here I am, an eight-year-old kid that has a dream of being a child, and it wasn't until 30 years old where I started keeping my first sketchbook, which mm -hmm. is just insane to me, but it's what the journey that I was on. Mm -hmm. That's what the I Am Human book is. It's from me being a brand new in the whole world of you know, figure drawing to my journey moving forward and how I was able to unravel and, and, and attain that skill of, of being a professional artist. So, so yeah, so fear brought me there and uh, thank God, you know, you have those moments where you hit, you hit a wall, everything breaks apart and then you get a chance to actually rebuild yourself again, hopefully into who you actually are and not who, who, who society, you know, told you you were. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. What a profound moment for you to, to feel that connection, to feel that belonging in a studio, to have that, that inner knowing, I want to say, that gives you that confirmation of this feels right. It was definitely the next step on the evolution. I mean, when I was in California, luckily I had an incredible artist community out there as well. When I was still in the Marine Corps and I, I found an airbrush community out there through a uh, coast airbrush and uh, my friend, Dave Monty, my, my buddy, Noah, Steve Van Diemen, Frank Serrano, Craig Frazier, all these guys that were just incredible artists. I was hanging out with them. And, and that's how I started doing art. When I first got out of the Marine Corps, that's how I really got back into art. Um, 
you know, obviously the, the drawing the human figure thing was, was the next evolution and where I wanted to take myself because, you know, a lot of these guys have been studying for years already. And I was kind of like, you know, I didn't do any more art than anybody else did. You know, it's probably the same amount of art you did when you went through high school. I took every art class. I was good at it, but I wasn't like really studying, you know, and I looked up to, I looked up to all these guys and, you know, and then when I got to New York and found these other, then I started looking up to all these high school kids and college kids that were, just unbelievable and they're like do you know this artist do you know that artist i'm like i, I have no idea what you're talking about you know but i'm gonna look up i'm gonna look up every single artist you're telling me i'm gonna i'm gonna do my my diligence i'm gonna do my work you know i, I remember jeff fisher saying to me one day because i told him after class one day i was like listen this is early on when i first first met him the first month or so i was like listen i really want to make my living as an artist and he's like he's like He's like, if you really want to make your living as an artist, he says, he says, you see all these kids around you. He see, he see, he said, they're, they're, you know, they know a lot more than you do at this moment right now. He's like, but you have experience in life that they don't have. Okay. He's like, my advice to you would be to take their energy, jump like whatever energy train that they're riding right now, jump on that train with them and just ride it as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And you'll catch up with them. You know, you'll be where they are because you have experience in life that's going to bring a lot more to your creativity at this moment that they, they have. They'll have to catch up to you with that. So that's pretty much what, what I did, you know, just head down, studied for like straight, um, it was a good almost eight years, wow. eight, straight, eight straight years of drawing the figure, you know, whatever it was, like nine hours a week with wow. critiques afterwards. So, you know, somewhere, somewhere around 12 hours worth of, training a week was so intense training mm -hmm. wow. that's what the i am human book basically shows you know it, it's hard to show all that but i yeah. took the best pieces of like, like all my successes all the things that i felt were like signposts on the way saying you know what this is working yeah you know and you're, you're moving towards where you need to be so that's that's yeah. pretty exciting I'm, I, I feel lucky to be able to have um, documented that in a sense so you know, I know it's not as probably not as profound as, as living the experience, but, you know, I hope that people do get a little bit of the sense that, hey, this, you know, this guy was kind of a beginner here for a minute. And then, you know, like you said, through diligence and, and perseverance, yeah. and it wasn't, all, it wasn't all roses. I can tell you that much. I, I spent plenty of day leaving that class, those classes, because I was doing it weekly. We didn't have any breaks. There was no breaks. There was no vacations. There was no summers. It was right. nothing. It was all just always be there. Yeah, I had plenty of times when I left those classes. Like, I don't, I have, I'm confused. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have, <laughs> this doesn't make sense to me, you know, the whole mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep going. But it's the passion and that drive that probably carried you through that process, right? I just think that, that this is what I was supposed to do with my life. So I didn't, it, it wasn't like a question to me in any sort of way that I needed to be there. It's just what my heart and my soul wanted, wanted to do. That reminds me of like the idea, like the, of the word talented people throw that word talented around so much. You know, I, I don't think they mean to use it, mis misuse it, but I think it's a misused word just because they're like, Oh, you're just so talented. You're just good at everything you do. You're good at everything you do. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm really not good at everything I do. <laughs> like you don't understand how many hours I put in to these crafts. I mean, every single day I'm practicing. I'm still practicing. The talent is, is the love. If you have a love for anything, eventually someone will say you're talented at it. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the attributes that put you in this space that you have now recognized, be it stepping onto that energy train when you first started the classes, the perseverance or being around these people, who were in your airbrush community in LA, fast forwarding now to where you are, what are some of those key attributes that you think you have learned along the way, but also could support others who are listening to this podcast of what is it they need to install for them to put them into that space of be it mastery or skill or fulfillment even? The, the things you just mentioned, mastery, skill, and fulfillment, those, those three things are byproducts of your desire or your curiosity for, for a subject. So all, you, all anybody needs to do in order to be 
to get fulfillment, skill, and mastery of anything is to be so curious, like a scientist. They have to become scientists of their craft. Like I'm learning the piano right now and, and music in general, but piano's new to me. I started reading music about a year and a half ago. So this is like a whole new thing to me. So it's fresh in my mind, the, the learning, the, the beginner experience of the whole thing. And most of the great instruction that I've received so far when it comes to piano, um, Herbie Hancock has like a master class that I watch. All, all these people pretty much are like, you need to find your own interesting ways to practice things. You need to discover like things that, you know, you need to become your own teacher in a sense and find ways that you can learn that makes sense to you. Discover, look deeper into things, you know, play two notes until you find a relationship that's between them. Um, draw little compositions or, or circles on a page until designs start to happen. You know, it's, it's all a matter of discovery. Like people say, I can't draw. Oh, people say that to me all the time. You know, it's like, oh, I can't even draw a stick figure. That's like the most famous quote yes. ever anybody yeah. ever said to me. And it's like, actually, you could draw a stick figure, but I did draw. So I drew stick figures. That's how I learned how to really draw the human figures. I just drew, I started posing stick figures. Right. called like mannequins it's that's also in the book uh, uh that was very profound and you know you know what i did with that i st i was terrible at first mm -hmm. my little stick figure mannequins were stiff they were just like nothing they were like a little more advanced stick figures they weren't you know but right but what i did was i when i was working in the city i it took like basically just copy paper from a printer and I, at the end of the project, for about over a year, every single day, I just drew those little stick figures and posed them, posed them, posed them, kept trying, trying, trying. I filled up pages, hundreds, hundreds of pages of copy paper with them covered front and back. No, all, no, not a sketchbook, nothing. Just, I drew a lot of them, basically, mm -hmm. is what it comes down to. It was my mm -hmm. own little science experiment. I was experimenting with it. And I do right. the same thing with the piano now. I have experiments. I'm like, oh, what if I do this? I have one song. I do that a lot. I'll take one very simple subject and I'll just keep playing. I have a one song. It's just like, um, it's like minor chords that keep moving and it moves through all the minor chords, all 12 minor chords. Okay. And it goes one to the other. And at first when I started playing, it was just like real simple. It was like very simple rhythms. And it was like, can I just play this like three notes in one hand while like a like an arpeggio and then just just hit the keys or hold the keys down for like four beats on my right hand and now i can't even tell you where this experiment is and it's still going mm. i'm doing crazy stuff i'm playing like multi-rhythms with this experiment and and i know that that's going to continue to evolve right. as i go along so that's what i mean if if people can can understand it's always be inspired always be curious and always conduct their own experiments with the things that they're learning to really dive deeply into them, then mastery, skill, and fulfillment will naturally happen as a result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is your intentions? The piano is probably a more specific thing just because I play, play the, I've studied, well, I've been playing guitar for a long time, but music in general, I like the piano because the piano is like a, a social instrument. So if there's a piano there and you're playing music, it's like people want to gather around the piano and sing. Like I used to go to piano in New York, New York uh, Hotel Casino in Vegas. There's a piano bar there where they have dueling pianos. Yeah. Probably the most fun I've ever had in my life at, out at a, you know, at, at a bar or something like that. It's just so much fun to sit around a piano and sing. You don't have to be a great singer, especially when there's a bunch of people. Or, you know, it's just like, I think we should have more celebration like that with music. So that's basically my goal. My goal is to learn this thing so well that I could sit there and play songs and, and not, not me entertain people, but to us to be entertained together mm -hmm. in a sense, because I think that pe human beings need to learn how to celebrate life more often. I think we forgot mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we lost our town squares where people used to come together at night and all celebrate the day. That doesn't happen anymore in modern society. It happens in other cultures. When I was in Thailand, they all have a, a town circle where they get together, they bring the food out, you know, they, they're selling things or whatever, but you know, they're celebrating life. They're saying, That's Hey, right. the day's over. Let's unwind. Let's celebrate the fact that we all made it through another day. Um, and music mm -hmm. seems to have fallen out of favor 
you know, it's like, oh, you got to listen to other people play music. No, I think we should be playing music. Hmm. And if it's only people's voices that, that they, that they are going to be feel comfortable enough playing, then that's where the piano comes in for me as, as far as that's concerned. But as far as the rest of my art is concerned, I think art in general, especially art, like creative art, I think what we've spoken with this with some of my artist friends and I, we kind of agree is that art's nice in a sense that it's, it's nice to see people that are, can accomplish, you know, or can make pretty pictures and things like that. And it's beautiful to, to look at art, but I think art's more for the person, for the individual person. You know, I think it's, I think it's a discipline that fulfills each person individually. And I think that there's great um, power in, in honoring the connection that we have to that creative spirit, which is the unknown, the bridge to between ourselves and, you know, the source energy, whatever you yeah. want to call that. Yeah. So I think that, I think that that's one of the more powerful things that, that art has for us personally. Mm -hmm. um, me, me personally with my art, I'm basically just, showing that connection constantly to the soul mm -hmm. you know i believe in the soul my message my main message and the thing that's driven me my whole life is like i feel like if i if i was going to you know leave the earth tomorrow i would just like make a giant sign or scream out to everybody like don't forget your soul because i think a lot of people have forgotten yeah they've lost the connection to the the voice that's in within them that's telling them exactly what it is they need to do with their lives yeah. and a lot of people don't even pay attention to that, but it's always there. And it's always saying, it's never like mad that you didn't pay attention to it. It's just like, Hey, okay. You know, this is what we should do. We should walk over here down this path in this forest and we should go over here and you should, we should look at this little, you know, shell that we found on the, on the ground or the rock. We should pick it up and contemplate it. We should do this. We should go take a trip here. We should take that painting class. We should, you know what I mean? It's like, so many things that I, I, I'm lucky enough that I pretty much just listen to it all the time. I've always have. That's pretty much why my life has gone the way it has. Yeah. But yeah, listen to your soul. You know, it has all the answers to to what you want to do. So that's that's where art to me is that connection to the soul. It's one of the easiest ways to be connected to the light. Mm -hmm. Because where does this stuff come from? When you draw a picture and all of a sudden something happens and, you know, you get these ideas and these things are flowing through you, that creative state, writers, you know, anybody who does a creative art or, yeah. or anything. Yeah. Even when someone's decorating a window box in their, you know, in their house or arranging things on their, you know, curio cabinet or building something for their house from, you know, with stuff from Home Depot. They're in that creative flow state mm -hmm. and they're connected in that way. Yeah. That creative imagination. It does it, it. It needs to come in from somewhere. It's to create that balance between the yin and the yang and the, the left brain and the right brain and how, how we are so unbalanced possibly in life of being driven through structure, through discipline and through um, action but yet bringing in the creative aspect so it can be married and it can be put in a beautiful union to work together rather than over amplifying one versus the other I think mm -hmm. is, is is a big challenge actually I, I wonder if it's a challenge I mean I, I'm assuming it is a challenge for people but one of the things that I think of on a daily basis is that how creative it has to, you have to be just to walk around the planet in our daily, in our daily walk. I mean, we're always making creative decisions as human beings because we're, we're sensing beings. So every time we walk, you know, even taking steps, opening doors, shutting lights, like, I don't know if other people do it, but there's a rhythm, there's an energy to it. It's almost like a choreographed dance. So we, we it's like we dance through the world. You know, we don't just, we don't just, we don't just move through the world. If, if you took, a, if you took a video of yourself doing anything in life, I don't care what it is, 
It could be reading a newspaper. It could, it could be anything. Of course, nobody reads newspapers anymore, but, <laughs> but <laughs> even if it was just flipping through your phone or something like that, or whatever it is, just human movement. If you took a still video of yourself for, let's just say four hours of your day of what you're doing, working on the computer, going this, getting a cup of coffee, all this stuff, and you put music to it rather than listening to the regular thing, it would look like a choreographed dance. Mm -hmm. It literally would. It is a choreographed dance. And we don't realize that. We do not realize how much we are in a rhythmic flow on a daily basis in everything we do. I notice it because I think like that. Um, and it's not like I'm listening to music while I'm walking around and shutting lights off. But, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an art to it. There's an art form to opening a door, shutting a light, closing a door behind you. It's... It, it literally is choreographed. Yes. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So I think people don't realize how, much, how creative they really are because they think of creativity being, I have to make art, I have to make music, I have to be a writer, I have to do all this stuff. But it's not, it's not true. It, it, takes, it takes a creative being to walk the planet. That's a really cool analogy. I really like that. I think it's also really interesting of how far we've come away from it to have it not be in our awareness. Yeah, exactly. The awareness is probably the key. And I think that's what I think about more often when I'm out in nature and I see things. Like, I don't really need to make art. I, I make art as a reflection of the beauty that I find in my own personal discoveries just because I'm just fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. But n n everybody has that. Sometimes I'll be like, like the Long Island Sound or something like that at a beach and I'll, I'll reach down in the water in the sand and I'll pick up the sand and it's like a black sand over there for some reason. And in that sand, there's all these like shells and rocks and things like that that are all colorful because there's lichen growing on it and things like mm -hmm. that. So it's like reds and greens and all this beautiful color. I look at it in my hands. So it drips down my arms. It almost feels like gloves that were like designed by, by Versace or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, this is where these people get this stuff from, you know? That's right. And I look at it. I'm just like, this is so beautiful. Like if I could just have a camera on my eyes when I see these moments of beauty, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to make art because they exist, mm -hmm. you know? And then I, I want to say, oh my God, that was so beautiful. I think I want to like show other people that what I saw, because mm -hmm. are, are they seeing this too? Right. Are they aware of this? Most people might walk into the water and be like, you know, oh, I don't like the way these things feel on my bottom of my feet or whatever it is, or, yeah. you know, they'll pick it up and they'll be like, oh, that feels weird. And they drop it and stuff like that. But it's like, yo, dive deeper. You know, like dive deeper. If you dive deeper, there's so much beauty waiting for you to see. You just got to get off this surface level thinking and this glass house type, you know, mentality mm -hmm. and, and delve into, dig your hands in the earth and see the treasures that await. There's so much treasure out there that it's just beautiful, beautiful moments. The earth is incredible. It's really yeah. incredible. And I think a lot of, it's at least in the, in, the, in, the, in the indigenous cultures that I've worked with, the belief is that at one point in time, man took himself from the fabric of life and pulled himself off of it and said, I'm above this. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm the ruler above all this. I'm not a part of that. Right. I'm the commander above what that is. And that's where we went wrong. We went wrong when we, it's okay to manage nature so that we live more comfortably, which is, th thank God we did that because, you know, it can be tough living, you know, the earth is unforgiving in those sorts of ways, but we have to remember that we're not different from that. We're not separate from it. We are a part of the fabric of life. Yeah. And I think that's what in doing indigenous ceremonial practices and getting myself back to who I really was, which is besides the art, that was the thing that really connected me back to my soul and to my, to the earth those practices reconnected me to the, to the planet. And now that I am deeply embedded in that, I get to see a little bit more of the treasures that, that life has to give us because I'm very aware. I don't miss things. I'm always looking for these things. I'm always appreciating, you know, a bird or a, a this, you know, and I know a lot of people do that, but I don't know. There's just so much beauty in it. But what a beautiful journey
from your eyes and for your soul to really relish in, in what Mother Earth has presented us? It's, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot there. Yeah, it is great because it's a it's comforting. You know, it's a very comforting to to be cradled in the arms of 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 this blessing that we we've been given. This planet, this planet is so supportive of us, and um, it's better when we when we're in relationship with it than when we're outside of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of support there. there. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned, honestly, and that's a lot of what happens in my art as well. Is I'll make something up on a piece of you know art or a song or something, and and then I just look at it as you know I'll, I'm not really attached to it like oh I made that. You know it's no it's like that got made. Mm -hmm. I happen to be a part of making it, but mm -hmm. I didn't make it entirely by myself. Something else made that. Now it's there for all of us. This is ours. And it's like, wow, look at all the lessons that are, that are being said here. You know, this is like saying, oh, you know, we have a connection to our soul. Or this is saying, um, you know, this. There's so many different like little lessons that I get from it. It's almost like a, a mythology is unfolding in front of my eyes every time I create something. And that mythology pretty much says that, you know, we're connected to something bigger than ourselves. So where are you going to go from here? What's next for Peter? I, I'm pretty sure my, my future holds more of me um, helping other people to connect to their creativity, whether it be in like a class or, or a course that I'm, I'm working on or workshops, in-person in, in workshops, mm -hmm. just to teach people how to be a little bit more like free of of their um, expectations of, of creativity. I think that's one of the biggest things that holds people back from being creative is um, pre-visualization, like having a specific expectation about the way things should happen and then not seeing what's actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. um, and you know, like I said, children are the, are, are the prime example of that because they have no expectation of what's gonna happen on a page when they start drawing. And that's why their work is brilliant. And, and our and our work can be brilliant too, if we if we learn how to let go of that expectation more, like just watch what's happening. Um, that's always how the best creative pieces uh, occur. Yeah. So I, I I'd like to I'd like to move myself into a space where um, I'm helping people to understand that, because I can see that that that's a major a major block for, I'm, and I understand it's a major block for people because I, I was blocked in that way as well. It took me years of training to really learn how to be fearless enough to not have a, an expectation of what I was going to draw on the page when it came to the human figure, especially after you start doing it a lot and you, you get good, you know, quote unquote, good at it. Then you don't want anything to be not good because, you know, you, you know, someone's going to look at that one day and it, yes. you know, it's easier to play it safe, but creativity always lies on the edge of um, the unknown. Mm. So I heard a quote one time. I don't know who said it. Could have been Matisse or Picasso or somebody like that. They said, as soon as an artist knows exactly what they're doing, they're lost. Yeah. Yeah. And you just become a replicator. You're not really delving into the unknown. I think the artist's job is to always embrace the unknown and see what comes of it. Isn't that also the journey of the soul? It actually is, but we've figured out a way to be comfortable enough to act like that's what's not really happening. Because life is complete uncertainty, but we've got, we built all these systems around ourselves that give us a sense of certainty, mm -hmm. that nothing's going to change, that we have it all figured out, that the roof over our house head is always going to stay there, that the food's always going to be on our table, that the water's always going to be clean. But the truth of the matter is that life is change. And I think that's where a lot of us get messed up because we don't embrace that or don't allow that to be something that's um, uh, you know, an option. And when life does change, and it does drastically at times, 
we get so railroaded by it. We get so run over by the fact that we weren't prepared for it. Mm -hmm. How could you not be prepared for it? Because that's what it is. You know, it's like, you lied, you lied, you've lied to yourself that, that nothing was going to change for your sense of safety and security, which is understandable, but that's not the truth. (laughs) That is not the truth. And that's another thing that indigenous cultural practices will teach you like sweat lodges and, and indigenous, you know, medicine ceremonies. Um, you're always every day waking up into the unknown. You may think it's known, but it's really the unknown. And the more, you, the more we can come to grips with it, and the more that I have come to grips with that, the more beautiful my life has become because um, I'm just more adaptable. You know, I'm like that tree in the wind, you know, or the leaf in the wind. Mm -hmm. I just go with the flow. You know, it's so much easier. People fight the flow. Once you fight the flow, that's when you get hurt. The rigidity of life can break you on many levels. It, It can break you, yep. And it's so much harder to recover from it. You know, if you put yourself into that, and if you choose to recover, some people don't even choose to recover or to, or to heal themselves from those things. But if it's so much easier to just be flexible, you know, and to let things flow and not be um, broken by circumstances um, than it is to be flexible, try to hold on to things that weren't yours to hold on to in the first place mm-hmm. and then get broken by them and then have to make the decision to get heal yourself and then have to go through the healing process to get back to the space where it's basically going to teach you to be flexible again. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Bruce, Bruce Lee had it figured out, you know? Yes, he did. Like, be, be like water. Be like water, my friend. <laughs> it's right. like, it's, like it's, uh, it's unreal. But we all do it. I'm, I'm no stranger. You know, I've been, I've been broken. But, you know, I've also had the opportunity to heal, which is beautiful. I mean, life's going life's gonna to hurt no matter what. There's no way to avoid it. But the, the faster you surrender to your circumstances and to allow those circumstances to pass through you, the quicker you're going to get through it. Yeah. What a beautiful conversation, Peter. Yes, from, from the elements of the awareness, the inner knowing of who you are, to the life lessons that are presented to us. Living life for others versus living it for yourself and stepping out on the ledge, but also leaning in to who you are through your artistry, through your play, through your creativity. Thank you for sharing your story and your journey and your life lessons of being playful, being aware, and just being full of life. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to have a human conversation. I'm Naranjan, and you've been listening to Master of Your Crafts podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review and join me next week for another episode. Thank you for listening.